We're gathered here in this gorgeous literary arts center that Ken and Nancy Kranzberg have gifted to our community. And it's very fitting because like this building, December is all about new beginnings. Most of you probably know by now that December was an icon in the American literary scene from the 1950s through the 1980s. Then it died for a while. Or we could use some favorite fairy tale lingo and just say it went down for a long winter slumber for 32 years before we revived it in 2013 with a gentle kiss and a lot of work. We celebrate that revival every day with December. We celebrate the fact that literature can be a life-saving experience for some people and a life-enhancing experience for everyone. Even in our artist portfolios, we celebrate language to understand how we feel, to understand what we see and what we experience. So thank you for being here today to celebrate words and images with us, to celebrate our 13th issue of The Modern Era, volume 30.2, to celebrate our St. Louis contributors in both of our 2019 issues, and to celebrate six years of hard work and dedication on the parts of so many people. As always, I do want to take a moment to just recognize the heroic efforts of our staff. Our managing editor, Jennifer Goldring, and our business manager, Judy Kramer, who are lurking. There's Judy, <laughs> Jen, is way in the back. Our inspiring and inspired art editor, Buzz Spector, who you'll hear a little more from shortly. Our fabulous poetry editor, Jackie Germain, who read her own work here last Wednesday at the Hilo's official grand opening. Our amazing prose editors, Elizabeth Brown and Sarah <coughs> Fredman. Our board of directors, Leanie Becker, Rashida Deinhardt, John Greenberg, Mary Stillman, my personal favorite, Todd Seawalk. <laughs> Our advisory editors who, who do live in St. Louis, Treasure Shields Redmond, Steve Schreiner, Bob Nazarene, and Sally Van Doren. And our editorial staff, who are the first eyes on all the submissions we read, including the ones who live in St. Louis, Rita Chapman, sitting over here, Matt Freeman, Rafal Redlinski, Gabe Montesanti, Leslie Schuler, Chelsea Sharp, and Danny Score. And of course, I want to recognize all the St. Louis writers who appeared in December this year. And the good news is that we actually have too many of them to ask them to all read today. But in addition to Sylvia and Alex, I do want to give an extra shout out to our advisory editor, Steve Schreiner, who had three spectacular poems in our spring issue and who's already read for us on a couple of previous occasions. And I want to, of course, acknowledge the St. Louis Regional Arts Commission and the Missouri Arts Council, whose funding directly provides the publication of each issue and these reading events. We couldn't do anything without all of these stellar people and organizations. And even if we could, it wouldn't be nearly as much fun. So we read submissions blindly at December. That means we don't know who the author is until we're ready to respond to them. And it means we're really selecting work based on the merit of the work. And that means that our staff readers' notes and comments on each submission are really important because it is all about the work. So when Sylvia Sukops first sent her essay, Pictures on the Heart, an Elegy for the Family Album, to December more than a year ago, the first editor who read it made this comment, I love this. Also, I am crying. I would definitely go to the mat for this one. That was just the beginning. The next editor to read it said, this is a spare, finely crafted essay that reflects on the end of life for the author's mother, along with the dying tradition of gathering photographs for the family albums. The images she describes are quietly wonderful. The conclusion she comes to is especially touching. If that doesn't make you want to read this essay, you might have a heart of stone. <laughs> Sylvia finished her MFA at Washington University last year and currently serves on the faculty of University College here. Her writing has appeared in a variety of publications and she's received fellowships from Penn Emerging Voices, Lambda Literary Emerging Writers, and a, and a Fulbright to Germany. I'm here to read an excerpt from Pictures on the Heart, an elegy for the family, family album. It's my great pleasure to introduce Sylvia Sukha. Thank you for being here and thank you for that lovely introduction. 
Um, before I begin, I would like to quickly thank Jonna and Jennifer and all the editors at December for giving my essay a home in the pages of their beautiful journal. Here, that's better, right? Mm -hmm. And for organizing today's event and inviting me to read. Thank you so much. I would also like to thank the Kranzberg Arts Foundation, um, their whole team of talented designers and builders for creating this amazing new space dedicated to the literary arts. It's an extraordinary gift to writers and to everyone who appreciates the power and urgent necessity of literature in today's world. And finally, I'd like to thank my students and dear friends who are here tonight, including my, um, I think they might, might be here, a couple of my own teachers, um, uh, and, uh, who brought me to St. Louis for the Washington University Creative Writing Program, and I would never have found my way to St. Louis without that. Um, so grateful that this city has now become my home. I dedicate tonight's reading to my mother, Hedvig, and my father, Paul, immigrants who arrived in the U.S. exactly 60 years ago this fall. This piece is titled, Pictures on the Heart, an Elegy for the Family Album. Late evening, and I sit alone at my parents' kitchen table. My mother is asleep in the bedroom down the hall. I hear her breathing through the baby monitor, propped on the lemon yellow Formica tabletop. We bought the device six months after her stage four cancer diagnosis, when she could no longer get out of bed. The year is 1994, and I've been visiting my parents nearly every weekend, a two-hour bus ride from New York, where I'm in my final semester of graduate school studying photography. Studying photographs is also what I'm doing at the yellow table, sorting through decades of family snapshots. This table, long and wide, is the same one we had while I was growing up. Two old church pews converge in a corner to seat our family of seven kids. I was raised here in Pennsylvania, but not in this house. With only my youngest brother still living at home, my parents have downsized. Now they live in a modest ranch-style house on the edge of a cornfield. It's quiet, even quieter, when everything's buried in snow like it's been this winter. So different from the thundering trucks and screaming sirens outside my city apartment. I like the quiet. I like mom's steady breathing through the monitor. I even like it when she snores. Nothing more can be done to prevent my mother's death, but I need to do something. I make it my nightly task to sift through our family photographs and put together what I envision as the definitive album of her life, the very best memories of her 55 years. Pictures with dad and us kids, and also from her own childhood, pictures that came over on the ship when she and my father immigrated to America. My mother kept our pictures in shoe boxes, tucked around the house, mostly unsorted. One box at a time, I spread them out on the table, starting with the oldest ones from the 1940s and 50s. These are black and white, scallop-edged, each one smaller than the palm of my hand. Both my parents were Catholic and grew up on farms during and after World War II my father in Hungary, and my mother in Germany. Photography was mostly reserved for special occasions. A first communion, a wedding, a new car, a prized cow. Everyone worked hard, but no one is shown working. There's my mother in pigtails, a slender teen with a girlfriend on each arm, in a dress she made from mismatched scraps of older, worn-out dresses. They walk a dirt road between the fields. The shot was taken from behind, so I can't see if the girls are smiling, but their stride is ebullient. There's my dad enjoying a glass of wine with friends at an outdoor table, and there's the motorcycle he would ride from village to village as an agricultural extension agent. Here they are at their wedding in 1959. He was 25 and she was 21. 
My mother is slightly taller than my father, and her light brown hair is pulled back in a bun, accentuating her broad cheekbones. She looks modest and eager, youthful and mature, all at the same time. Smiling always made her squint and revealed a small gap between her two front teeth. But pictures don't tell the whole story. The wedding gown and flowers were not their own. These were extravagances the young couple could not afford. My mother borrowed the white dress and veil and the abundant flowers decorating the church, thanks to canny scheduling on the part of the betrothed, were also appropriated, left over from a major religious holiday the day before, the Feast of the Ascension. Lately, my mother's breaths have been getting farther apart. I fear that they will stop altogether, but the hospice nurse says the spacing is normal at this stage. Being the oldest girl in my family meant that I was always the deputy mom, helping with everything from diaper changing and homework to cooking and ironing. The babies after me came quickly, and it, just, and it seemed just as quickly they disappeared. They became toddlers, started school, developed into entirely new beings. I got my first camera when I was around 10, and I loved taking pictures. Our life as a family moved fast, and pictures helped hold it still. Pictures promised to hold it forever. I imagined someday sitting down with all the pictures and seeing it all over again, maybe telling stories to my own kids as they leaned in to look and listen. But I didn't expect it to be like this, a solitary prelude to my mother's disappearance. I go through more boxes on the table. The photographs from the 1960s, mostly taken by my father, are vibrantly colored three-inch squares with a date imprinted on the white border. Starting in the 1970s and 80s, I am often the photographer. These pictures, high gloss, borderless, take a jump in standard size to four by six inches. Many remain packed in the same envelopes along with matching negatives as the day we picked them up at the pharmacy or parking lot photo kiosk. With age, their colors shift toward orange and red, like leaves at the end of fall. I make a point to choose pictures of my mother alone with each of the seven children to show that we each had our own special relationship with her. There's my long-haired sister Linda baking with her in the kitchen, my crew-cut brother Michael at eight years old, his leg in a cast, broken for the second time, seated on the lawn, he leans back against our mother. Here I am at the Jersey Shore, standing with her in the foamy blue water, both of us laughing, the ocean waves a safe distance behind us. After my mother's diagnosis and surgery, I intended to make her the subject of a new portrait project. But she wasn't comfortable being photographed, did not want this time in her life, evidence of her diminishment preserved. So I stopped and turned our attention to the archive in the shoeboxes. With a cassette recorder running, I asked her to tell me the stories behind the pictures. We didn't get very far. As she got sicker, her energy faded, even for talking. Now from another room, night after night, she breathes me through the ritual of assembling the album. Back in New York, my graduate work culminates in a thesis exhibition. I dim the lights in my section of the gallery, and since fire regulations prevent me from using real candles, I place battery-powered votives flickering before <coughs> photographs of my mother. As a new mom, beaming beside a pram-style baby carriage in 1960, and more recent in a head and torso portrait seated at a hospital window, a pale blue sheet draped from her shoulders, her face eye to eye with the viewer, that tiny gap between her teeth. In the center of the otherwise darkened gallery, a gentle spotlight limbs a vintage baby carriage stripped down to its metal frame, 
on which I've mounted a dark room developer tray. Inside the 24-inch tray, I float a giant enlargement of a black and white snapshot taken when I was a toddler. My mother holds me on her lap in a wading pool, tiny waves casting shadows, and we are laughing beside my father and brother Michael. That watery image inside the wet darkroom tray, inside what's left of a baby carriage resting on spoked wheels, stillness and the memory of movement, grief and the memory of love, darkness and the memory of light. Both projects came to a close that spring, assembling the album in Pennsylvania and mounting the exhibition in New York, and so did my mother's life. Our family kept vigil and we were at her bedside when she died. After washing and dressing her body, I pulled her stiffening hands together at her chest, interlocked her fingers, and bound this gesture in place with rosary beads, as she had asked me to. Then, in the tight space where her hands now pressed at her chest, I slipped a photograph of our family over her heart. A large delegation, my father, my siblings, our partners, and I, flew my mother back to Germany and laid her to rest in the cemetery outside the same village church where she and my father had wed. I brought the photo album to share with three generations of relatives who gathered to mourn her passing. The album was a deep well of memories and more stories, and it helped us bear the loss. I brought it back home and took it with me when I moved from New York to Los Angeles. Later, I boomeranged back to the East Coast for a new job. When the cross-country moving van came to pick up my furniture and boxes, I made sure not to put my mother's photo album on board. I had heard too many horror stories about boxes going missing and never recovered. <coughs> Instead, I placed the album in a special case, a hard shell art portfolio case, that I planned to take on the plane with me. The day of my flight was frantic, packing everything left in my apartment, and I ended up with five or six pieces of luggage at curbside check-in at LAX. I wasn't worried, though. Pre-9-11, you could slip the sky cap a couple of 20s and get everything on board hassle-free. But somehow, in the hectic moments of that transaction, the portfolio case disappeared. I didn't realize it until after the plane took off, and as soon as I landed in Boston, I called both the airline and LAX, but they had nothing matching my description. Not that day, nor the next, nor the many times I kept calling. I had appointed myself caretaker of my mother's pictures, one of a kind, irreplaceable, and now I had lost them. I was furious at myself and so ashamed it took years to tell my family what had happened. I consoled myself with the thought that at least no one had died. Today, families amass hundreds of images before the baby turns one, and thousands more after that. Most are never even printed. No longer accumulating in closets and drawers, they now live in clouds in external memory devices, and on social media. When people move, and today we move more than ever before, our photographs are immat immaterial. They exist largely in digital cold storage, removed from our lives in a way that empties them of their stories, their power to bind us across generations. Which is worse? having had precious few family pictures and losing them, or having so many that they too are lost, never once held in the hand or fixed to the heart, vanishing from the start. I know which I would choose. <laughs>